Happy Sunday, everyone. Greetings. Welcome. We're happy to have all of you here today. Today, we are going to discuss a subject that has to do with something billions of Christians are observing around the world. We're going to talk about Easter. What are the origins of this holy day, historically and doctrinally? What can it mean to Baha'is? That is what Peter Terry will explore this coming Sunday, today, with us. And again, the topic title is Exploring Easter, a journey through its history, doctrine, and significance to Baha'is. With that being said, just a short little piece on Peter Terry. Peter has presented several times here on Clearwater Baha'is with the community, and we've been so happy to have him discuss various subjects. He's even hosted a whole class on the Kitabi Ikan, and he's also hosted a book of the Bab called The Bayan, another important book that everyone should become familiar with. That being said, we've been able to, thanks to Peter, discuss various subjects which fits within his areas of specialized knowledge, which include pedagogical theory and practice, Western classical music, Jewish, Christian, Islamic, Babi, and Baha'i history, and scripture. With that being said, and not to delay us any further, we want to welcome Peter and thank him for coming here today. And uh, more importantly, as we are uh, around the world um, observing Easter, we are looking forward to reflect on this very important holy day. And and the, what what is the uh, Baha'i perspective that Peter has? So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. I'm I'm uh, happy and honored to be invited to um, present to you today. I wanted to read a passage, which I thought of uh, early this morning, when I saw the news that the Easter holiday had been uh, it had been decided by the um, president of the United States and the head of government of Australia to replace Easter with another secular observance. And I wanted to read a quotation which I think relates directly to that theme and one that um, we don't usually talk about much, but I think it's very important, it's very timely for us to consider it. This is from the Epistle to the Son of the Wolf, and it's, co it's a quotation from the Kalimate Firdausi of Baha'u'llah. The second word we have recorded on the second leaf of paradise is the following. The pen of the divine expounder exhorteth at this moment the manifestations of authority and the sources of power, namely the kings and rulers of the earth. May God assist them and enjoineth them to uphold the cause of religion and to cleave unto it. Religion is verily the chief instrument for the establishment of order in the world and of tranquility amongst its peoples. The weakening of the pillars of religion hath strengthened the foolish and emboldened them and made them more arrogant. Verily I say, the greater the decline of religion, the more grievous the waywardness of the ungodly. This cannot but lead in the end to chaos and confusion. Hear me, O men of insight, and be warned, ye who are endued with discernment. So now I will uh, proceed with, uh, with uh, my presentation. My presentation has two parts, and I don't know if there'll be time for both of them. We'll see. Mm -hmm. One part is historical. Another part is doctrinal. In other words, speaking about what is the purpose of Easter, what is uh, the, um, uh, how does it fit in uh, uh, the belief system of the Christian people around the world. So first of all, I want to begin with quotations 
that you will see quite soon are per pertinent to Easter. And this has to do with when does Easter occur? Why does it occur then? What are his, its historical roots? And we begin in a place that is forgotten even by many Jews and not known by many Baha'is. And that is that the first month of the Hebrew year of the of the uh, Hebrew people, of the children of Israel, um, including the Jews, who are the descendants of one of the children of Israel, whose name is Yehuda, and which is Judah. So their original calendar as described in the Torah, in the book of Exodus, and other books, the first month was called Aviv. And in Aviv, this was the first month of the Hebrew year, of the Jewish year, originally, biblically. And the quotations about this, uh, I'm not going to read all of them because it would be too time-consuming, but I'm going to tell them to you now so that you can write them down and read them for yourself. So I'll read a couple, and then the others I'll let you uh, find for yourself. In the 12th chapter of Exodus, we read in the second verse, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. And then in the 14th verse, and this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generations, ye shall keep it as a feast by an ordinance forever. And then on the 15th verse, he says, Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread, howbeit the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until, until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. So this is a very serious commandment. You want to be part of our community, you're going to observe this holiday. This holiday, which is what? Which is the first day of Aviv. What it turns out, what is the first day of Aviv, according to all biblical commenter, ter, uh, commenters uh, and interpreters? It is the first day of spring. It is the vernal equinox. It is Nauruz. Okay? So, big surprise, because, you know, we've been going by uh, other Jewish calendars, a calendar that was started um during the Babylonian captivity, and then elaborated over centuries and centuries in various ways. And that calendar is the calendar that is now followed by the Jewish people. But important for us to know where the original month of Aviv began. And it was on the vernal equinox, the same as Nauru's. So then we come to what was the original reason why this day was celebrated as being a very important day and why and this was the principal reason why it was celebrated and that is because it commemorates the day that they left captivity in the land of egypt and so in verse 12 uh, verse 17 of chapter 12 you read and you shall observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, for in this selfsame day have I brought your hosts out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall you observe this day throughout your generations by an ordinance forever. Uh, so there are a number of other passages in this 12th chapter, and also in the 13th chapter, and the 23rd chapter, that refer to this Holy Day, the first day of Aviv, and then the festival of the unleavened bread, which was commemorating the release from captivity from Egypt. So, how is this eventually morphs, of course? The season of spring was called, and when they, during the Babylonian captivity, 
when the Jewish people uh, adopted um, a great deal of um, Aramaic into their vocabulary, because Aramaic was the living language in Babylonia. So they renamed the first day, the first month, Nisan. Originally Aviv, now it became Nisan. And they called the whole season of the month of Nisan, Tekufa Nisan. And what was this? This was the month, the first month of the year. Again, like the month of Baha in the Baha'i calendar. And uh, also the first day of Nisan was also the vernal equinox. So then if we take it uh, to, to the next step, we come to the fifth day, um, uh, the, the fourteenth day of Nisan, which was when um, when there was to be a special commemoration, and that co commemoration was called Passover. And Passover is detailed. You have many passages in in uh, in the uh, Torah about Passover, and there are the part of the th really interesting thing about this original holiday was that it included the unleavened bread it also included the sacrifice of a lamb which was then consumed on the day of passover in commemoration of this liberation from israel and the fact that pri prior to the uh, liberation from Israel, uh, the angel of the Lord had told the Jewish people to put on their doors a, a, like a red paint. Or no, it wasn't a red paint. No, it was the blood of, a, of a, a, I think, a sheep. And so this was the reason why it was called Passover was because the angel of death would pass over these places where there was this color that identified that we are part of these people who have been oppressed. We are the ones who are being liberated. And this was in retribution for the, the behavior of the Pharaoh at that time who was trying to commit a genocide against the Jewish people. One of the many times the Jewish people have had this happen to them. So, um, you have uh <laughs> so you have this this occurring uh the pesach uh is happening at this time uh, again the, the sources for pesach are in the torah uh they're detailed um and i have a document which of course i'm going to send in and you're all welcome to go into all of these details uh because to try to cover everything in by simply reading what I've written would take much too long. So let I want to bring to your attention that there are various possibilities when it comes to Easter. Where did Easter come from? All right? And one of the possibilities is that at the time that Jesus was living and his disciples were living, the celebration of Passover might have begun on the first day of Aviv, but we're not sure because the records are not all that clear about whether Passover was actually starting on the 14th day of Aviv, also in Nisan, or whether it was starting on the first. And the reason why we're not clear about that is because the Bible doesn't fill in every detail. It talks about the original intention of the Lord. The original intention was that this holy month really was to begin the year. The year was to begin was the first day of Aviv on the vernal equinox. And then it was going to celebrate the liberation of the Jewish people from slavery and their, their propulsion towards the Holy Land, which was their promised land. So that was the theme. So 
We don't know whether he was celebrating it on that fated night and during the last summer supper, whether that was occurring on the, the first day of Nisan or the 14th day of Nisan. And it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter because, as you will see, the ambiguities in terms of calendar calculations just begin there. It, 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 it's they're they're much more complicated. In any case, they did. This was a commemoration of all Jews. So of course, Jesus was Jewish. His disciples were all Jewish when they got together. They were getting together in the evening, and they were uh, commemorating this important festival, which is in tr Jewish tradition. The holy days are the, especially the festival, the major festivals, which include Pesach, are celebrated as Shabbat, Shabbatot. They are sacred to God. They are dedicated to God. You're not allowed to work then. You, um, uh, you must spend your day in worship of God and in other holy actions. So, um, a, a, an interesting parallel for you might be that the Persian celebration of Nauruz lasted for 12 days, and it featured a unique diet. And it, for, it featured a um, haftsin with seven different varieties of, of symbolic foods. And the Jewish celebration of Pesach lasted 14 days and also featured seven different special foods that are on that day. So, uh, and there's even also a parallel with Easter, because on Easter, Easter does not last for 14 days, but it's preceded by Lent. So actually, between Lent and Easter, you have almost the same number of days of commemoration. And, um, and then also you have, always Easter has been commemorated with a special meal that has food that you don't eat at other times. So when, when Jesus commemorated Pesach at his Last Supper, he instituted the ceremony of what we call the Eucharist, which is a consumption of wine and blood, blood bread, as symbols of the sacrifice of, of Jesus' blood and body to redeem the world. In the Christian calendar, this Last Supper was commemorated on the evening of Good Friday, that is, on the very beginning of the seventh day of the week, because every Jewish day begins at sunset. So you you don't, uh, what for us is just evening, right, because the beginning of the day is actually at midnight. For the, for the Jewish people, and by the way, also for all Muslim people, uh, the day begins at sunset. So you wouldn't begin your Pesach meal until sunset. So the original, uh, so whether in Aviv or in Nissan, the calendar is going to be the same on this. It's going to begin the Feast of the Unleavened Bread and the actual consumption of the lamb, uh, the sacrificial lamb on the 14th day. This is going to occur. It's going to start the sunset before. Okay, so so we have uh, we have an anomaly. The report that we receive in the in the Bible in the Gospels makes the statement that Pesach that uh, I'm sorry that that the Last Supper occurred on Friday night. This is what it says. And it says that that Jesus was crucified on Shabbat, on the the day after. Okay, well, this is very problematic. Chronologically, it's extremely unlikely. And uh, why is it unlikely? Because Jewish people do not condemn people to death on Sabbath, and they certainly do not crucify on the Sabbath. And even the Romans are the ones who did the crucifixion. Uh, it seems very unlikely they would be parties to that. Now, I want to I want to say that 
in making these comments, I'm not in any way trying to undermine Christianity. I'm not trying to call into question the uh, the attempts to 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 tell the truth that we find in the Gospels. And certainly, as as I quoted that that passage about supporting religion, uh, I'm not uh, in any way denigrating religion. I'm simply bringing up the fact that when we're seeking for unity between religions, we must identify those things that don't fit. We must find those errors that have occurred, because there are plenty of errors that have occurred, that have caused misunderstandings, that have caused um, frictions and unhappiness and often death. And this continues to be the case. So in the case of, of Jesus, the likelihood that he would be arrested on the night preceding the first day of Pesach is almost nil. Who would arrest him? No Jew could be involved in such a thing. And then he was going to be seen by the Sanhedrin, either that night or the next day. It's just unspeakable. How could that happen on the day of Pesach? You know? And so, and then and then he would be crucified that night. And but it's more complicated than that, because let's say he was crucified on Friday night, then three days later is Monday night, not Sunday night. And it's three days later that he rose from the dead. So it doesn't also doesn't really make sense, you know. Um, so it's, uh, and I say that because the convention has become that you have Good Friday where you're commemorating this last supper. And then on Sunday, two days later, you have this, this, uh, Easter celebration about the resurrection. And so first of all, does that have a biblical origin? It doesn't. There's no biblical origin for that dating at all. There's none. And you can go and you you can read my paper and see in detail what I've talked about. But then you can also go check it out for yourself. And that's what I would highly recommend. So I want to bring you now some, some historical background about how Easter came to be dated when it is dated. All right? Now, first of all, Christians had to settle at some point on the current timing, on the timing of the Easter holiday. That did not happen. In theory, in principle, it did not happen until 325, the year 325, which is nearly three centuries after Jesus died and was resurrected. Right? Before that, there was no standardization at all. We have no idea how it was celebrated during those prior, those prior times. The calendar in use by Christians and by everybody in the Roman Empire was the Julian calendar, which was named after Julius Caesar. And Julius Caesar put this calendar into practice in the year 45 BC. So approximately 40 years or so before the birth of Jesus. And it was fully enforced uh, at that time, and in fact was fully uh, utilized uh, in Rome and by the Christians in, until the Gregorian calendar was established in the year 1582. All right? So... For a very long time, they were using the Julian calendar. And the Julian calendar um, uh, was, uh, was therefore used for the calculation of Easter, right? Now, something we must understand is that the current dating of Easter is based on the Gregorian calendar. And the Gregorian calendar came in 1582 but 500 years earlier, in 1054, the church split into two halves. And that occurred when the Pope of Rome and the Pope of Constantinople excommunicated each other and all the Christians in their respective realms. 
That meant from 1054 on, there were two Christianities. The Christianity of the East followed the Julian calendar, and so did the Christianity of the West until 1582 when it adopted the Gregorian calendar. So then we come also to another shift that occurred that, that affected a great deal of people, and that is when the Reformation occurred in the 16th century and then thereafter. Protestant churches calculated Easter according to the calendar and adjustments of the Roman Catholic Church, but not at first. Not at first. You think about when Luther lived, right? When and when the initial the Reformation began. This was not adopted by Protestant churches until between 1753 and 1845. So you see, it's getting closer and closer to us. And before that, uh, the actual times that the Protestants were observing Easter, we don't know. We'd have to do a lot of research on that. Maybe somebody's written a doctoral dissertation and you can find it. But in any case, there's a lot of disagreement, a lot of variety. And it, and of course, the, although most Christians at that time and to this day are either Roman Catholics or they're Protestants. There are still many, many Christians who are of the Coptic Church, of the Ethiopian Church, of the Eastern Church, and these follow different calendars, and these have different calculations about when Easter would occur. Now, how can we trust that Cal calculations of calendar smiths with regard to the timing of events that occurred more than 1,500 years earlier. You see, there was no consensus among Christians during those 1,500 years. So you see, it's there's a lot about Easter as, as a holiday on the map that is very uncertain and has been uncertain from day one. Another thing that that we can uh, observe about this is the current celebration of Easter in our own country. And I don't know, I'd be very interested to know how it is in Wales, so maybe Peter will tell us about that, and maybe someone else will tell us about another country. In the United States of America, the principal observance of Easter has nothing to do with Christianity. Shocking statement, eh? All right. The rituals associated in our time in our country with Easter are the decoration of eggs, an Easter egg hunt, rabbits. Yes. Having fun with the children. They have no biblical origin. The word Easter may derive from a German, a Saxon spring festival called Estre, which may be named after a goddess of spring. However, this goddess of spring is only mentioned once in the writings of a, of a wonderful British monk named the Venerable Bede, who lived in the late seventh and early eighth century. So we're not really sure about that either. And this festival uh uh this festival as it's come to to be realized in 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 our country would have been a celebration of fertility if it was associated with a goddess of spring as that's what's happening in the spring everything's coming to life and the egg and the rabbit are both symbols of fertility the four former because it's they are proof of the fertility of birds, and the latter because rabbits are famous for their fecundity. So there, that's that could be one explanation for how it came to be called Easter and how we came to have these on unbiblical customs associated with, with the holiday. Another thing that is possible and probably about as far-fetched as, as the as the, the naming of it after a, a 
the Saxon goddess of fertility, is that it might be derived from the feast that started, that occurred just before Passover, just before Pesach. It's the feast of Purim. And why would I say that? Because the name of King Ahasuerus' wife is Esther. And Easter and Esther are very similar spelled. Furthermore, Esther saved her people, the Jews, from being eliminated by Haman. Similar to the Passover story, where the people who have been in slavery, the Jews who have been in slavery, are liberated by the by the Passover of the angel of death from, from being exterminated by the Pharaoh. In a sense, Esther could be seen as a symbol of fertility, not in the sense of having many progeny or resurrecting souls from the grave, but something similar that is just as much a guarantee of procreation and of survival. She saved her people from certain annihilation. Also, this, the festival of Purim, during which the heroism of Queen Esther is celebrated, takes place every year, a short interval before Pesach. So there's another thought to think of, another thought to think of which, which brings it close to, to the Easter celebration, is that Queen Esther, uh, Queen Esther established a banquet this is a, a, one of the most important um, themes in the in the story of the Book of Esther. It's, it's cited in the second verse and in the uh, second chapter and the ninth chapter. It is about the Seuda, Seuda Esther, which is the banquet of Esther, during which she brought in all these people, and then she pleaded with the king to to not allow. Her her miss her his minister to annihilate the Jews. She did it in public. And this is what what saved them because the, the king was basically in a situation where he had to, in order to save face, he was going to have to listen to his wife. And so this there there may be a connection here with the history of 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 Easter, but then th this is a connection that's very tenuous because we don't know about how it uh, how how it evolved. So, I think what we can say with some assurance is that the resurrection of Jesus, which is commemorated on Easter by Christians, and and which is which he predicted to occur three days after his crucifixion that it occurred shortly after Passover, either during or immediately after the end of the festival of the unleavened bread. And therefore, they became associated as being at the same time. And I think we can also recognize that Jesus appropriated and repurposed two symbols of communion and reconciliation of God that were part of the weekly Shabbat ceremony, and part of the observance of Pesach as well. These two symbols are called Kiddush, which means blessing. And they involve praying over wine and bread, consecrating it to God, and then distributing it to the celebrants. This is exactly what Jesus did. In, the, in the, all the accounts of the Last Supper, he did that. And by the way, he did that at another time as well, which is mentioned in in the in the Gospels, but this is the this was the important time because it was the last time, and it was the final rem uh, the the final uh, encouragement to to remember this occasion and to mark it and to observe it always. So, what is he doing? He says he calls upon his disciples to drink the wine as if it was his blood and to eat the bread as if it were his body the symbolism of shabbat was that he is consecrating his blood and his body to god and this is completely understandable from the perspective 
of a Jewish person, because that's what the Shabbat Kiddush is all about. Well, he personalizes it, and he links it to the sacrifice of his life. And because he says in his gospel, you must take up your cross. You must take up your sacrifice if you are to follow me. So this is this is not just telling them, his followers, what he's going to do. He's telling them what they have to do. And also, it combined the symbolism of Shabbat with the symbolism of Pesach, which was that he was sacrificing his blood and his body for the redemption of humanity, even as the Jewish observers of Pesach were sacrificing a lamb to commemorate their liberation from slavery. So these are, the symbolism is very rich. The symbolism was meant to, to have a permanent impact on the Christian community, on the followers of Jesus. And it did. But how it came to be understood and how it came to be uh, implemented by Christians is another matter altogether. In the in both cases, the purpose of this sacrifice was not in any way to glorify himself because God glorifies Jesus. Jesus doesn't glorify himself, ever. He's always submitting his will to God's will. The purpose of this sacrifice was to celebrate liberation. And the liberation in his ritual and in his teaching is the liberation from sin from carnality, and from estrangement from God. Only the soul that has been redeemed through sacrifice could attain to the new birth, the new covenant, the new life that Jesus promised. So that, that in a nutshell, is, is the theological content. But I will, I will go... Uh, I originally wrote this with the historical part at the end because I wanted to uh I wanted to think about the the first part the the theological part first so I have now gone to the end and now I'm going to the beginning so for millennia before Jesus existed and by the way by some strange a uh, very strange sort of uh, error of history. Jesus is one of the very few manifestations of God who has been misnamed for thousands of years. The proper name of Muhammad is Muhammad. The proper name of Baha'u'llah is Baha'u'llah. The proper name of Krishna is Krishna. <laughs> the proper name of Zoroaster is Zoroaster. But for some reason, and it has to do with the Romanization of the faith, it has to do with the fact that the name was translated into first Latin and then translated into English, but without observing the Latin pronunciation. So the name of Jesus in the original Hebrew, is Yeshua. And he was known as Yeshua ben Yosef, or Yeshua min Nazareth. That's the original Hebrew. And Jesus doesn't mean anything in Hebrew. It means nothing at all. Yeshua does mean something. It means Savior. And so, very important because in the Predictions of the coming of Jesus that you will remember in the gospel. Mary has promised that your son will be the savior of humanity. And, and this is uh, the, the theme of the savior is, is throughout his teachings. He so often is saying, I'm not here to judge. I'm here to save. And that's why he says, you, you will criticize me because I'm, spending time with poor people, with prostitutes, with tax collectors. But I'm come to save. I'm not come to judge people. But my return will be the judge. My return will be the king. And he will discern between the good and the evil. <laughs> I excuse my cough. It's um, 
nothing to do about it. So, uh, when when Jesus predicted that he would rise from the tomb three days after his death, it was understood by his followers that this would happen bodily, physically. Thus, when there were sightings of prophets and saints who had risen out of their graves after the death of Jesus, in the, this is reported in the Gospel of Matthew, it was understood to be a bodily resurrection. Everybody believed this was, wow, because that was what they believed. Everybody believed, all Jews believed in bodily re resurrection. Not just all Jews. All those people around the world who believed in resurrection, coming back to life, believed you would come out of the grave and you would be restored in your body. It was a miracle. It was not something that 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 uh, that you could, could explain in any other way. And when Jesus was not found in his tomb on the third day after he died and was buried, it was assumed that he had been raised bodily from the tomb. That was a miracle that only God could accomplish. And then there were sightings of Jesus who had been raised bodily from the dead. There were sightings by Mary Magdalene. There were sightings by two disciples on the road to Emmaus, by 11 disciples in the Galilee, and by a number of disciples while they were fishing in the Sea of Galilee. All of those sightings, and you know, the Gospel of John says there were many more. All of those sightings and the stories that are told, they are written in such a way that the reader would believe what everybody believed at the time, which was this was a bodily resurrection. Okay? And so this is an important issue because what are we celebrating? What did Christians celebrate on Easter? It's the resurrection of Jesus. And that is believed to be by traditionally all Christians, to be a bodily resurrection. So let us look at this from a different point of view. This, this was how the Jewish people understood resurrections of Enoch, of Elijah, and Elisha. It was said in the Bible they were taken up into heaven physically. This is what they believed. This is what they saw. So they assumed that it would be the same with Jesus. If he's taken up into heaven, it's going to be in his body. So let's look at this from the words of Jesus. Jesus said that he would return in the same way that he came the first time. Now, how did he come the first time? Did he come down from heaven? Did his body descend from the heavens onto the earth? No. He was born to a woman. And he was actually assumed to be the son of her betrothed, Joseph. So as far as people who were associating with him during his life were concerned, he was considered to be a normal guy, born in the normal way. Okay? <laughs> And then when Je Jesus said to various people that he would return to them from the heavens and that all would see him during the generation that was living contemporaneously with him. That means at the same time as he was living, he said, in this generation, you will see me come down from the heavens. They assumed he was going to return in the flesh, physically. Jesus was always fighting this kind of materialism. Whenever he would, uh, whenever he would give a parable, he would he would talk about something spiritual, and he would use a parable. And the people looked perplexed at him and didn't understand. And then he would explain to his disciples. He said, "You can understand. This is the meaning of this parable. Every single time, 
the parable was a story told in physical, temporal, earthly language about something spiritual that, that could only be understood by people, particularly at that time, in, sort, in some kind of a symbolic language. So for well, there were there were sightings of Jesus after his ascension by Stephen and by Saul, who became Paul. Those were spiritual visions. They weren't physical appearances. Stephen sees him in the clouds, but it's not physical clouds because nobody else, nobody else around Stephen saw Jesus. Only Stephen saw him. And when Saul sees him on the road to Damascus, he's the only one who sees, who hears Jesus speaking. These are real appearances by Jesus to people. And since then, I don't know if you use YouTube for more than recreational purposes, but I've been, been trolling a lot to learn about what Christians say who have had direct experiences of Jesus. And they're all spiritual ones. They're all ones in which they experience him in the next world, in a, in a world of dreams, in a state in which they're uh, uh, close to death or maybe even on the verge of death. And they come back and they tell these stories of meeting Jesus and of talking to Jesus and of what Jesus said to them. They're never physical. So when you think, when the patriarchs, I'm talking about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Moses, and the Hebrew prophets, the many prophets of, of Israel, and the parents of Yeshua, of, of Jesus, of Joseph and Mary, and the prophetess Anna, all of these people had visions of God or an angel speaking. These aren't physical phenomena. These are spiritual phenomena. But they were assumed by people of the time, and they are still understood by many, many readers of the Bible to be physical, to be bodily. And so I'm going to say something shocking. I'm going to say, we tend to look around us and say that we live in a materialistic age and most people here in this world are materialistic and they only believe in what their senses experience. Well, maybe the people in the time of Jesus were materialists too. And maybe the people of the world have been materialists for millennia. Maybe we're just stubborn and maybe we don't trust God and maybe that's why he has to continue to send messengers to us forever to wake us up to the spiritual reality, which is so non-physical that it's incomprehensible to us. So I wanted to um I wanted to point out that there are some exceptions to this materialism. There were some Jewish and Christian writers and thinkers who believed that resurrection of Jesus and the resurrection that was promised to all of his followers was a resurrection from the grave, that is from being buried and dead, and from the dead body to the spiritual realms. In other words, there were some who believed that there was a spiritual meaning to resurrection and no physical meaning to it. <laughs> some of them, some of them were called Gnostics. Most or all were branded heretics. And they, some believed in and wrote about these experiences. And there are authors of the Apocrypha, the Pseudepigrapha, and the Gnostic texts, which comprise many, many, many books, and were probably extremely more numerous at one time than they are now. Considering that the mainstream Orthodox Jewish and Christian leaders 
had plenty of time to destroy texts. And they were very successful at, at destroying a lot of them. I don't know whether any of you have heard of Nag Hammadi. Nag Hammadi is a place in the desert of Egypt where in 1945, very large urns, pottery urns, were found in the desert filled with manuscripts. And the manuscripts that were retrieved and not sort of broken up and sold to who knows who or used as you know, to start fires or whatever, the ones that were preserved were studied by scholars and have completely revolutionized our understanding of how widespread this spiritual thinking was. And um, so there was, there was an opposition, let's put it that way, to the mainstream materialistic way of thinking. So, <laughs> so I want to ask, did, did Jesus intend that his prophecies about his return <laughs> would be interpreted in a physical or spiritual way? Well, I think you know my theme by now. He meant in a spiritual way. He always meant it in a spiritual way. If he meant it in a physical way, then his revelation was a failure because he made promises that were not physically fulfilled. Right? And, and even the ones that the promises that he did make that were physically fulfilled, they have to have a spiritual meaning as well as a physical meaning. Because otherwise, they could only be meaningful for the people who experienced them. And this is something that Abdu'l Baha tried to instill in, in, in the Baha'is through his talks, is to explain miracles are a proof for the person who experiences the miracle. That's it. They are not a proof for anybody else. Because you didn't experience it. You don't know what happened. All you know is what somebody reports, somebody's experience of what happened. And that doesn't mean that it's what happened. We often mistake the material for the spiritual and the spiritual for the material. We mix them up because we're human beings. So, <laughs> in a key to the answer about the spiritual nature of his prophecies is what he said in the Gospel of John um, 3, 6, in the first epistle to the Corinthians 12, 3, the second epistle to the Corinthians 2, 12, the book of Revelation, and the many explanations uh, of his parables. In all of these passages, he explains over and over again that enduring realities are spiritual, while physical realities have only a temporal, a temporary existence. For example, he said, we should store up treasures in heaven where they will not be corrupted and perish. But there are so many quotations that could be cited in, in, in support of this theme. So what is he here? here this is directly related to his prophecies, and it's related to his resurrection. Remember, in the Gospel of John 16, chapter 16, verses 12 and 13, he says, I have yet many things to tell you, but ye cannot bear them now. Albeit when he who is the spirit of truth is come, he shall guide you into all truth. And the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 26, he says, that the spirit of truth shall teach you all things. And <laughs> most Christians have also believed, along with believing in the physical resurrection of Jesus, and therefore necessarily the physical resurrection of Christians when God, when Jesus comes back again, because that's what's said. It says when he comes returns, then the believers will be resurrected and they will be into a new life. Resurrected from where? Physically. That's what people believed. That's what many Christians still believe. So most Christians have also believed that the spirit of truth was not another manifestation of God, was not the return of Jesus, that it was 
the Holy Spirit being manifested. And they point to a specific day, the day of Pentecost, uh, which corresponds to the Jewish holiday of Shavuot, which is a commemoration of the revelation on Sinai of, of the Torah to Moses. So they read those passages that talk about Pentecost, and they say, well, this is when this is when the Spirit of Truth came and manifested itself, and all the gifts were, of the Spirit were given to the people. And, and there is a certain way of reading those passages in which that is, seems credible. Except there's only one very small group of Christians in the entire world that believe that the gifts of the Spirit bestowed during Pentecost are still accessible to Christians. Think about this. They're called Pentecostals, of course, naming it after the Pentecostal, the holiday of Pentecost. So let us consider this. If he promised that the Spirit of Truth would come, he not only promised that he would come, he said that he may abide with you forever. And then that then that means then, but in reality, he came in Pentecost and, you know, the people there had the signs. And then after one generation, then nobody had them anymore. They didn't have the gifts of the spirit anymore. How is that forever, my friends? It doesn't make any sense. So, and because it's a misunderstanding of a promise. He gave a promise, and instead of understanding what the promise meant, they came to their own understanding, their own interpretation. <laughs> um, as you can see, I'm having a trouble with this cough. It's just going to get worse. So what I would like to do is uh, send my whole paper which goes into plenty more detail. And uh, Jeremiah can post it up on the website or make it available to you in some other way. And um, if, God willing, uh, uh, there's desire for us to uh, explore this theme more together, especially the spiritual interpretation of the prophecies, then I'd be more than happy to present again once my cough has disappeared. And for now, I think I will stop and um, invite you to make comments or to, uh, or to ask questions. This was also very moving. There is so much to think about. Of course, this paper, we look forward to sharing that in the video description, looking on the Clearwater Baha'is website to also include it there. We we thank all of you who, again, have visited. If you haven't already, visit clearwaterbaha'is.org. We have information about the speakers and, of course, the content that they've shared with us. That being said, we have some questions that have been put up, but unfortunately, I'm having uh, trouble understanding some. So, I'm going to say the ones that I can see congruent just to read off and 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 tell Peter. So here's this one I found. It's from iPhone 2. I'm sorry, I don't have the person's name here. In addition to incongruities in calendars, there are intrinsically uh there intrinsically would be problems in language transliteration, especially going from oral to written so many years, decades, centuries after the crucifixion. Yes. Well, as it happens, the Jewish people have a record of writing things down that goes back way, way back. And there's all kinds of documentary archaeological evidence of this. That's not just based upon biblical tradition or other other um, historical traditions. It's based upon really, you know, straightforward um, physical evidence. So the Jewish people have been writing down their beliefs and things that were occurring around them for a very long time. And as a matter of fact, what's happened with scholarship is the more we dig literally in the Holy Land, the more we dig, the more we find. The more sophisticated becomes our analysis of carbon, carbon uh, dating, um, 
the the more we find um <laughs> the older we find that things are and for example one of the things that was really astonishing when they put together what is uh almost complete book of isaiah found in the Qumran caves that is in the dead sea among the dead sea scrolls when they put it together and they compared it to the cur current text of the book of isaiah used by jews in the synagogue it was almost identical which is unheard of you know in most textual uh you know lineages there's so many errors that creep in and but we have to remember that for the jewish people the word is sacred they believe this is the word of god you can't make mistakes with the word of god to this day if you go into a synagogue you cannot get up and read from the torah unless you know you have the training to do the reading properly because to mispronounce a word is is just regarded as a, a scandal you know it means you weren't ready to serve god in this way so don't do it and uh and this is one of the reasons why orthodox jewish families raise their children from the age of three to study both hebrew and aramaic because those are the two languages used in the bible because they want their kids to be able to to read the word for themselves and read it fluently it's actually as important or more important more important because this is about your soul you're talking about this is your identity as a jew is to be able to read the scriptures for yourself and to think about them for yourself so i don't think we have problems with transmission of texts for the most part i think the problems are interpretation and baha'u'llah concurs with that baha'u'llah backs me up on that statement because in the kitab Egon, he says you know there's nothing wrong with the scriptures the scriptures are just fine there's no corruption the problem is you guys who think that you know better and you're going to interpret for other people and then he says you have to understand that human learning does not help you to understand the word of god that the way to understand the word of god is to purify your heart it depends on you having purity of heart and purity of mind to be able to then encounter the text and see it for what it truly is and that is the challenge uh, for every Baha'i, but it's also our liberation because we don't have a priesthood. Thank God we don't have a priesthood. We don't have anybody to turn us astray from the true meaning of our scriptures. We can go and study them until they reveal themselves to us. And they do. They reveal themselves magnificently to all who will study them. So I can... You know, you'll see that I can go on and on about one question. So I better stop and invite someone else to to speak. Thank you so much. Thank you. So there's so much that can be discussed, and not not to say that, of course, there there is one spelling, but what would be perhaps uh, more commonly accepted or uh, um, an e an easy way to spell what you said that is Jesus's actual name, Yeshua. Uh, how do we uh, oh, spell okay. that? Yeah, no, I'm sorry. I've, I saw a couple of questions uh, from people about that. Yes, Yeshua. Yeshua is spelled, and I'm, this is straight from the Bible. It is it is a name, a proper name that was given a number of people before Jesus. So Jesus was not a, a newcomer. He, it wasn't inventing a new name for him. And actually, it's the short form of Yehoshua. Yehoshua is the name of Joshua. That's what Joshua actually, that's how much we reduce Joshua. And by the way, the, the pronunciation in, in English, we have a J for jo Joshua and a J for Jesus. But the J was taken originally from the German spelling, and J in German is 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 pronounced like a y so this is the original spelling starts with a y it's y e s h u a 
Yeshua. That's your spelling. So Thank you so uh, much. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, this is uh, <laughs> something that a lot of people I uh, I know will have a question for, but just to clarify, this isn't the language in English. This is just the phonetic spelling of the actual name in another language, correct? This is this is actually well. First of all, it's it's a correct uh, transliteration of, of the word in in Hebrew. Yeah. So this is actually what what his name was, because he was speaking Hebrew, right? And Aramaic. If even if he was speaking what was called Palestinian Aramaic, which was kind of a colloquial language of the time, which is a little bit different from Hebrew, because Hebrew is the formal religious language. Um, even if he was speaking that, it was still Yeshua. It's the same word. Um, so as far as use in English, something that you should all know, there's a group now, a very interesting group of Christians who are returning to their Jewish roots. Some of them are Jewish. Some of them are Jewish converts to Christianity. I, I know some wonderful people in Israel who are Jewish converts to Christianity. They're usually called Messianic Christians, although they don't necessarily identify themselves that way. And then in the United States, there are many uh, congregations now of Bible-based and Hebrew-based, uh, Jewish-based um, uh, Christian congregations. And uh, I happen to know one that's um, in, in a, uh, a city not too far away from me, and it's almost 100% black. So it's not just Jewish people that are doing this, but they sing, they sing in Hebrew, they use Hebrew in their sermons. They do not call Jesus Jesus, they call him Yeshua. And all of the Messianic Jews also call him Yeshua. And by the way, somebody asked about the Christ. The Christ is the Latin word Christus, also originally from Greek. It is the ver the translation of the word deliverer from the Hebrew. The Hebrew word is Mashiach. Now we're familiar with that word because it was anglified in in uh, this very famous piece uh, that uh, George Frederick Handel wrote in 1842. Remember that? I mean, 1742. Um, and it premiered in Ireland, in Dublin. And it's called the Messiah. So the Messiah is Mashiach in Hebrew. And that's, uh, I can give you the spelling for that one too. That's M-A-S-I, M-A-S-H-I-A-C-H, Mashiach. Or actually, it's pronounced Mashiach, Mashiach. Where, and, but Yeshua is pronounced Yeshua. The emphasis on the second syllable, but Mashiach is on the first. <laughs> so, why am I giving you all this, the Hebrew lesson? Because actually, if you ever have the opportunity to speak with Jewish friends, or for that matter, Christian friends, about the Bible, about the teachings of the Bible, about the teachings of Jesus, about the teachings of Yeshua, if you can actually teach them the pronunciation or mention the pronunciation, correct pronunciation of Mashiach and, and of Yeshua, you you got some brownie points because there are a lot of people who don't know about this. And it opens a whole new world because then instead of, you know, building our whole concept of who he was and what he was teaching on what we've received from biased reports that that came through centuries and centuries of religious interpretation of uh of dogmas basically of dogmas uh of dogmas that very often divided more often than they united 
1054, great tragedy for the church. Jesus wanted more than anything for his followers to be united. He says, this is the most, this is my new commandment to you, that you shall love me as I have loved you. He wanted Christians to be all united. And of course, because he wanted them to be united when they would encounter his return and unitedly embrace the return. That was his intention. That's always the intention of the of the manifestations of God, that his followers will remain the very best of friends uh, at all times. And yet in 1054, the, the, the whole community breaks in two. And after that, in the 16, uh, the 1500s, uh, the community fractured in Europe because <laughs> um, because uh, a pr two prominent Roman Catholic theologians um, pointed out to the Pope that we're doing some bad things. We're doing some things that aren't in the Bible. And we shouldn't be doing them. It's unchristian of us to do them. And so that resulted in both of them, Luther and Calvin, being excommunicated from the church. And that became this big division that we still have to this day, where the number of uh, Protestants actually exceeds the number of Roman Catholics, but the Protestants have broken into 40,000 sects. They're so, and the Roman Catholic Church, which considers itself the universal church for all Christians, although it is the biggest denomination in the world, 1.3 billion people are known to be Roman Catholics. Nevertheless, they do not represent the whole of Christianity, not by a long shot. That's one of the tragedies of Christianity is that it has broken up into so many different sects, all saying, I'm right. You know what Abdul Baha said about that. He said, if you say you're right, and the other person says they're right, and you insist on your point of view, then both of you are wrong. It doesn't matter what you think, because you went about it in the wrong way. You violated the truth by considering your opinion and your point of view to be more important than being united with your brother or sister. And this is his whole message, isn't it? His whole message is, is bring unity to the world. We all have to be united. We don't have to agree. We don't ever have to agree. We can disagree all the time. That's fine. But we must love one another and treat each other with love and fellowship and kindness and all of those wonderful virtues because that's the only way out of the mess. And what a mess we're in. Next. Next question. Ah, uh, I don't know what happened. Let's see. Can you still hear me? I can hear you. Okay, okay. I wanted to. I wanted to uh, shout out to uh, Olga. Um, I don't know whether Olga is from Russia or in Russia, but in either case, our prayers are with you for the great suffering of your people, the great suffering. Thank you so much. It's been really insane here. And we're all praying that peace will come to Russia, to Ukraine, to Israel, to the whole world. I have a question. Terry. Um. Why is there such a similarity between Christian and Christ? Why do they sound so similar? 
because a Christian means a follower of Christ, right? So uh, that's, that makes a certain amount of sense because you have to consider it this way. If you are a follower of the Messiah, of Moshiach, um, you have to distinguish yourself in some way, right? And then, well, I was, I was, I was talking about Krishna of Hinduism. Why does Krish, right? Krishna? Oh, Krishna of Hinduism. Oh, oh, well, well. First of all, that that the two have nothing to do with each other. They're written in completely different scripts. Um, uh, the calculations for the birth of and and therefore the lifetime of krishna are like uh, 350 bc um and uh and a completely different uh uh language as i said um but also remember it's krishna it's not christ there's no t on that <laughs> uh krishna has an um uh, after the there it's it's k r i s h n a as opposed to c h r i s t right so quite different only the only the kr is the same all right everything else is different um and uh I have a beloved friend in uh living in um living in India who is uh, uh currently writing a book that is going it will be the first book of its kind to talk about the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita and how they are related to those of Baha'u'llah. And it's going to be a really an eye opener when people can read that book because Krishna was teaching the same gospel as Yeshua as the same gospel as Muhammad, the same gospel as Baha'u'llah. The, the teachings line up. But you wouldn't know it. You wouldn't know it because the interpreters are always talking about how things are different from each other. That's That seems to be their purpose in life, is to show us how, how different we, we are, are from each other and how impossible it is to, uh, you know, harmonize or uh, re reconcile the people with their differences. But as we know from Baha'u'llah, that's not the case. The whole purpose of the faith is to reconcile. It's to bring people together. And that's always been the purpose of religion. As Abdul Baha said, one of the fundamental principles of religion is that it is to unite people, not to separate them. He even says, if religion is, is separating people if it's causing hatred rather than love, then we are better off without it. That's pretty astonishing for a religious leader to say. It takes a lot of courage to say that. But it's the truth. Hi, Peter. So I, I think uh, Sandra had a question. She at least had her hand raised. So if you would like, Sandra, go ahead and unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, yes, I, in the light of what uh, Terry was saying about the fact that the sightings were not real, because I, I was thinking of doubting Thomas, where he was invited to put his hands into the holes made from the sword into the side of um, of Ye Yeshua. So, do we do we agree on the origins? Do we except that there is such a thing as a virgin birth and that the the uh, the angel Gabriel brought about the pregnancy because these are one of the this is one of the points that Christians use to differentiate Christ from other religions and to put him in a status that is above that of what we see as, or other manifestations are all equal. Yes, uh, no, very, very good question. So, um, doubting Thomas. So, 
it is completely within the power of the manifestation to make you experience something. He has that power. Yes, the manifestation has actually enormous power. They can work physical miracles. But as Baha'u'llah pointed out many times, for me to do physical mirrors, mir uh, miracles is to debase myself. It's to, it's to play your game. You want me to play your game. You want, oh, well, show us what you can do. You know, you want to treat me like a magician. And I'm not going to. I'm not going to rise to the to to the challenge. I'm going to say no. You have to listen because the the proof of the manifestation is in the teachings. Because this is how I want you to be living. You know, you don't have to believe even believe in me. What you have to do is believe in my writings. You have to believe in my teachings. That's the important thing. So, Downing Thomas, Downing Thomas tells Jesus, "I'm not going to believe you and unless I can stick my hand on your body and I can feel you. Fine. Manifestation can do that. He can give somebody the perception that they're touching his body. This is actually attested by people who have met Jesus, heard Jesus, seen Jesus, touched Jesus in their dreams and their visions. They have experienced that. And they talk about it on YouTube. And I have no reason to doubt that they've actually had real experiences. Some of those people, it, they they had that experience and it completely changed their life. So it had to have some reality to have that kind of influence. So Downing Thomas, you know, you want to play, you're, you're not going to become a believer unless you, I, you touch me. All right, I'll let you have that sensation that I'm real. You know, I'll let you see the stab wounds in my body. Okay? But notice, nobody else is going up to touch Jesus. Nobody else. They're looking at him, and they're listening to him. And this is, they're trusting that by looking and by listening, they're experiencing his reality. And what kind of eyes are they looking at, looking through? We don't know. We don't know, but we know if Roman Catholics can have a group mass experience of an apparition of Mary that they all attest to as being real, then surely, um, you know, Jesus could have appeared to a large group of people at the same time. Why shouldn't he? He has the power over nature. He is, he is the means by which nature has come into existence. We don't, we don't understand the manifestation correctly if we think that he's limited by his humanity. He only accepts that limitation to the degree to which it is necessary. But if it's necessary, he exceeds it. There's a wonderful story. I want you to look at this. It's called a, a book called The Stories from the Delight of Hearts by Mirza Haydar Ali. And um, this book is out of print, but I believe that you can find it online. And who knows? I think it was published by Kalimat. So maybe uh, you, e you, can, is... you can find it online. Yeah. It's available. Yeah. And it's oh, cool. George Ronald, actually. Oh, okay. So maybe if you can find a, a link to that, and you know, you could stick that in the chat or something so people can look at it. So in that book, and I don't remember which page, but it's okay because you should read the whole book. It's fabulous. Mirza Haidar Ali was a very close associate of both Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha. And um, and one day he said to Baha'u'llah, Would you show me your glory? Because Baha'u'llah was not in the, he, he did not normally show his divine appearance, you know, his true self, if you will, as a manifestation. It's too much for people, and he knows it, so he doesn't do it. But he was asked by Mirza Haidar Ali, and Haidar Ali talks about it. He explains it, and he's mostly talking about his emotional response to it. 
because he said, I can't describe it. It's impossible. Well, I think the same thing, the same thing happened with those early Christians. The early Christians were seeing Jesus, but they don't. But you know what? It's very interesting. First time Mary Magdalene meets him in the garden, she doesn't know who he is. She knows that he's this guy and he's talking. She doesn't recognize him because he didn't take the appearance of the Jesus in his body because he's not in his body. He's 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 a spiritual appearance to her. And then suddenly she recognizes him, right? And and the same thing happened with the the two men who who had they were in effect being accompanied by this vision of of a person and they were talking to him. And then suddenly he uh, they see who it is. They recognize who it is, right? And then they have this extraordinary conversation with him afterwards. And the same thing happened with him when, when he met with the 11 apostles. So these are spiritual appearances. And the spiritual appearances, you see, we've been indoctrinated by millennia of materialism that the spiritual is not real. When the manifestations tell us, no, it's the exact opposite. The physical is unreal in comparison to the spiritual. There are infinite spiritual worlds. You live in for eternity in those worlds. And this world, you're only here for a little while. Then you get sick and die. Any one of us could drop off today. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Because this world is only a preparation for the other one anyway. We're here to, we're, we, we're getting our training wheels here. Then we go to the next world. That's where the real party starts, you know? But, you know, we have to get it right here. It's really important for us to do the maximum we can while we're here so that, you know, so that we'll really have a good party when we go there. I was saying to my friend Peter, who's here, that uh, a friend of mine recently passed, Robert Parry, who, who lived in England and sometimes in Poland. Wonderful man, wonderful man. I visited him many years ago in Wales, and uh, and but I didn't feel the shred of sorrow at his passing. I just felt this joy, this joy that he's been liberated from his body, which was clearly not working very well. He was sick for a long time, being taken care of by his ninety-year-old mother, and and he flew, and hooray for him, hooray for any of us when we fly. So again, you know, there was there was some truth. There was some truth in the Christian Science Church, the Christian Science teaching that the spiritual world is the real world, because in comparison to this world, it is more real, infinitely so. I'm sorry. What was the name of that book? Stories from the Delight of Hearts. Terry, may I ask um, your comments on the the, the so-called virgin birth? And oh yes, it, yes, yeah. Oh yes. Well, first of all, I think it's really important for us to understand there was kind of a tradition of virgin birth in in um, uh, in Jewish scripture. You look and there are a number of women who, how about Sarah? Here's a good example for you. Sarah's like in her 90s. And the angel comes to her and says, you're going to have a kid. And she laughs. You've got to be kidding. <laughs> There's no way I'm having a kid. <laughs> look how old I am. Well, she has a kid. And that kid ends up being the 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 one to whom the mantle of prophethood is passed. So he takes up after Abraham. So um and there, there are a number of other examples. For example, the mother of Samson. That was a miraculous birth, too. And so, and by the way, this miraculous birth, it doesn't seem to have been known to uh to John, to the apostle John. And I say that because in uh, in one passage of, of his gospel, he's talking about 
Joseph being his father. Well, who would call Joseph his father if he knew that he, you know, that he actually had a divine father? Well, simply not talked about. It's not, it wasn't important. For early Christians, they weren't impressed by that, and they probably many of them didn't know it. What mattered about Jesus was something else. Remember that 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 experience that he had. He was he was baptized by John the Baptist, his cousin, <laughs> who was turning who was turning Jewish society upside down with his prophetic intensity, with his prophetic insistence. You must, you must repent, for the coming of the Lord is around the corner. You must, and so. And you must, by repentance, the symbol of repentance was, was a baptism in water. In the water of the, of the Jordan River, by the way, which is cold. Um, and, and so, uh, so the, the, mirac the miracle of the birth of Jesus is, is something that's recounted by the, by the Gospels. And it has a truth. It has a great truth. But we mustn't think that the very first disciples of Jesus knew anything about it. They didn't. They didn't. They didn't care. They met him when he was about thirty. You know, uh, some of them later on, and they they were encountering the manifestation of God, an enormously powerful soul that they felt so attracted to that they instantly became his followers. That's. Time after time, these are men with jobs, with families, with property. They leave it all behind and follow him instantly, you know? And Baha'u'llah actually talks about this kind of instant, obedient response to the manifestation. In his writings, he talks about the same thing. That, that kind of response of the soul instantly to the, to the master, to, to your Lord, to your Lord and Savior in this case. So, so for the early Christians, they didn't need to know that he was a virgin, had a, had a virgin birth or a virgin mother in order to become Christians. Maybe later on it becomes more important because, look, what happens over time is people need miracles, more and more miracles, okay? Jesus said very clearly in the Synoptic Gospels, he says, I'm going to give you one proof, one proof only. And this is talking to the Jewish people of his time. And that proof is that I'm going to return after three days. Okay? You're going to kill me, and three days later, I'm going to come back. And he was pressed for all kinds of other proofs, and he would not give them. And so all of this thing of citing, you know, his, you know, uh, uh, exorcism of devils out of people, and the, the miracle of the bread and the loaves and the fish and all that stuff, as if they were proofs of Jesus— if we didn't have those proofs, then it can't be true. You know, if he's not born of a virgin, it can't be true. That's a bunch of nonsense. Listen to what he says about himself. He says, because you are so lacking in faith, I'll give you one sign. And that sign is that I'll come back in three days. And, but this is the thing. This is, again, our obsession with the material, the manifestation of the material, the power of the material is we want all kinds of physical evidence. You know, if if Baha'u'llah had gone and like, you know, taken Mount Everest and plunked and, and thrown it into the sea, then, then maybe we'd believe in it. But of course we wouldn't, right? Because we'd come up with some other excuse. and say, well, you know, okay, that's pretty good. Let's see if you can do something better. So Baha'u'llah knows how human beings think. So when a representative of the clergy came to him and said, we want a proof that you are who you say you are. What did Baha'u'llah say to him? He said, go back to the other people and decide on one proof and bring it to me and it will be manifested. Did the guy ever come back? No. No. Because he's got a doubt lurking in his mind, and so do his fellow colleagues. Maybe he is who he says he is. 
And if he fulfills that miracle, everything changes for us. We don't have jobs. We don't have any kind of special rank or standing in society. Our whole life is turned upside down. Uh Uh-uh, not worth the risk. Bad investment. So yes, that's, I, I think we have, we, the way that we know that the, that Jesus was born of a virgin, how do we know it? Because it's affirmed not only in the Gospels, it's confirmed by the Quran, it's confirmed by the writings of Baha'u'llah. Okay, so now you have three manifestations saying it happened. But Abdul Baha did, had did a great response to that. He said, in effect, it happened. Get over it. Right? If it was such a big deal, then Adam was superior to Jesus. Because Adam didn't have a mother or a father. Okay? So if you're looking for a miracle, that's that's the best one right there. Right? No physical mother, no physical father. I love that argument of Abdul Baha. It's found in some answered questions. Because of, of course he's 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 kind of he's trying to make you laugh at yourself. He's trying to make you realize how it's unre- unreasonable to set your faith on conditions that don't matter. It don't they don't matter. Jesus is unique. Jesus is extraordinary. Jesus is so many things. He doesn't need us to add things. We don't have to invent special characteristics of Jesus or believe in special characteristics of Jesus that are not essential. What we need to do is do exactly what he said to everybody. Listen to my word and follow it. Who's the next victim? No, we, I think we, there will be no more for today. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it was very, very, very valuable that you were able to come here and, and speak with us on these subjects. And we really thank you for this, Peter. We thank you because you're able to be so eloquent in expression and describing the Bible, describing the, the Baha'i books and, of course, relevant books to the, the subject. We are going to try to get your paper up so everyone can look at your citations and the the content you're basing, what you're saying on. Uh, One last thing, though, we want to ask everyone who's joined today to please like this video on our YouTube and the Facebook page for the Baha'i Center of Clearwater. We welcome you, please, to share this video with your friends and maybe start a discussion, elevate some conversations among yourselves, you know, discuss some really important subjects during this Easter. Because, again, it's it's a very important time. And of course, what more important than to try to discuss the truth with one another and base what we are saying on the holy text. So with that being said, we wish you all a happy Sunday. Again, thank you for joining us, Peter, and thank you all for having been here this morning and providing your feedback, your questions, your comments. Have a happy